Sorry, was that, uh, did you say I should start it off? Okay, hi everybody. Marcella is actually in the background here. Uh, we are here calling in from our new Sunset Park um, district office. Um, so apologies, a little hectic, things have been getting set up today, but I'm really excited to be here. My name is Jenny. Um, I work mainly in GSA in the debt and finance working group with Nathan and a lot of amazing other organizers. Um, we never imagined when we started organizing for this campaign about a year ago that it would become uh, GSA's kind of top priority um, for 2021. It's really grown beyond anything we could have ever imagined. Nathan and I mainly work on the policy side of things, on the legislative side of things. Um, and I think we're excited to tell you a little bit more about that. Um, so, to just jump right into it, you know, we have a campaign. It's very simple. It's to test the rich. Um, it was necessitated by kind of coronavirus and the huge budget gaps that have opened up in the state budget as a result of the economic impact um, of the coronavirus on the state's budget. Um, prior to this, you know, for about the past 10 years, every single year when the budget rolls around in April, advocates have mounted aggressive campaigns to try to raise revenue, increase taxes on the wealthy in some form um, with very little to no success. This year is kind of different because the default is that we are going to have to make cuts and that there are huge gaps in the budget. Um, so we in DSA saw a huge opportunity to kind of blast open the conversation, go for a much bigger scale of new revenues than we've ever considered before, but also to design the taxes in a way that would be understandable to a mass audience and would start to educate around some of the fundamental injustices in not just our tax code, but our economic system at large. So Nathan is like huge in the kind of formulation of this platform, and I'm sure we'll go into it in a lot more detail, but at a very basic level, our campaign is very simple. We have six bills to tax the rich. Collectively, these six bills would raise more than $50 billion of annual recurring revenue for the state. This is a huge amount of money we're talking about. We're talking about pretty much doubling the current tax revenues of New York State, doing it in a way that won't collapse the economy, taxing high income, taxing wealth, and taxing big business and the corporate sector. Um, so we've been in the process of kind of refining these bills, drafting them, getting them, finding sponsors for them, getting them introduced. We're working with a huge coalition of, I think it's more than a hundred different groups, big political players in New York State, um, and have moved them around to this platform. So right now I'm excited because the third bill out of the six has just been introduced in the New York State Senate, the corporate tax bill. So everything's moving. We don't have much time. We have about three months left. Is it three months? Like two, mo two months left um, in this current budget session to try to win something. What we're up against is Cuomo, his austerity agenda, you know, we've had 10 years of Cuomo's budget to read and analyze his politics, I mean, his policy, more importantly. Um, and we know that he is not going to be one to suggest anything like this on his own. In fact, what he's put out is very, very modest, it's a tiny, tiny increase that affects the top 0.1% and then it's fully rebated. Um, so we really have an opportunity here. Um, to put everyone else on the defensive because the default situation is cut. It's cut to Medicaid, it's cut to education, it's cut to programs that nobody is okay with cutting. Um, so, you know, it's really exciting. Um, there's a lot going on, but I will, instead of going on for too long, I will turn it over to Nathan, who's going to tell you a lot more about the bill and the campaign. All right, thank you, Jenny, thank you, Jeremy. I have to say, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm going to talk through a few um, slides. We, we have this little presentation, we call it the Tax Roadshow, but we've been going around uh, giving basically this talk to different DSA groups, different nonprofits, different unions, and saying sort of here's um, basically a framework for taxing the rich. This is a way to raise a lot of money, get us out of the pandemic. Uh, you should support it. But I always add this bit where I say, what this really is, is political education around taxes, because I think that's something that's important for the left. 
And some people kind of don't give a shit and some people space out and some people say, oh, that's interesting. But uh, this is a place in particular where I think that message should res resonate. So uh, I'm gonna talk through some of the bills and go through um, the sort of interesting parts of that presentation. But first, um, I wanna frame it out in a few ways um, in the respects that I think are sort of relevant to socialist politics. So, you know, the, the most basic question is just why tax? How, how do taxes uh, fit into the political picture? Um, it sounds very boring. Um, fortunate, I can tell you it's actually not as boring as it sounds. Um, and, and it's also important to know, but we do sort of have to say that um, it's, you know, the, obviously we all care about spending and what the government spends money on. Uh, and that's something that's very important to us as socialists. That means that we also have to care about the revenue side and where the money comes from and how you get the money. And that raises a lot of questions that I'd say are somewhat under discussed. Um, we're not here to like have some debate about modern monetary theory. I don't really want to talk about it, but suffice to say, it is important to raise revenue um, and we can't really dodge that conversation. But that means that we also have to sort of develop a political discourse on the left of just being able to sort of debate taxes. That's a culture that very much exists on the political right. You could find any podunk legislator in any state complaining with a high degree of detail about taxes, and we really don't hear it on the left. Um, and I'm gonna kind of come back to that theme as I talk about some of the details in our proposal, because another sort of related um, point is that often, um, you know, and understandably we make very um, basically like humanitarian arguments for the necessity of spending where you say, you know, it's like, look at the people who will suffer if we don't have stronger welfare programs. Uh, our schools are very important. We can't defund our schools. Um, but there's also sort of a tendency to seed the ground on the sort of big picture economic perspective uh, to not even sort of develop political responses to the arguments we hear against taxes and, and to just treat them skeptically. Um, now that we're in a position where there are a lot of elected leftists at both the federal and state level uh, who identify politically as socialists, again, kind of have to develop the, um, you know, political apparatus of very specific uh, arguments around taxation. So uh, with that said, there's another kind of um, big picture point that uh, I want to recognize before getting into the details. And that is that uh, this is very sort of firmly rooted in a kind of social democratic frame. Uh, you know, the tax revenues generally rely on private enterprise. So you're taxing businesses, uh, you're taxing the profits of those businesses or the incomes of individuals um, that often enough are, are coming straight out of or related to uh, the profits of businesses. And so that can be sort of distasteful because then it looks like we're very embedded in capitalism. Um, and that, is the reality. And so to the extent that we're interested in immediate legislative victories, we sort of are working within a social democratic frame. Um, but we can also think of taxation as functionally part of a sort of transitional strategy to something that looks more, like, more fully like socialism. Um, it's a way to really challenge capital ownership. It's a way to equalize economic power. And it's a way to build out the state uh, in very functional terms where the state starts to provide basic services uh, and, and affect basic transfers. So I think that's the sort of political picture to have in mind, especially in response to people who say, well, you know, we should be post tax or something, we shouldn't have to worry about these questions that commit us to, um, you know, the existence of private enterprise. Um, okay, so a little bit more practically and concretely, what does it look like to have a sort of socialist political strategy around taxes? Well, some of the fundamental principles that we've adopted are that one, um, we don't talk a lot about experts and it's not because we hate experts or something, it's that we really want um, sort of intuitive explanations and arguments around tax policy. So we're gonna talk about the income tax and that's something that everyone should understand. And again, those are actually the kinds of arguments that you tend to hear a lot out of right-wing political discourse, just very intuitive everyday ways of talking about taxes. There have been past versions of um, campaigns to raise revenue in New York State. And I'd say generally there's more of a tendency to say, well, this is sort of like an economist approved list of policies. Uh, and 
we have we have really avoided that sort of perspective. So it's not like some black box where we say, you know, this is this is a good policy. Joseph Stiglitz said so. Do what we say. Everyone's supposed to be able to understand what's inside. And to that end, we try to do specific political education around the actual proposals. So with that in mind, um, let me try to share my screen here. Who oh. knows how to do this? Are you not able to? Uh, I, normally, I am not running the slides, to be honest with you. Jeremy, do you know how to do that if I send you this link? Yeah, sure. Sorry, everybody, just one second. Okay. Sorry, everybody, for the delay. Um, While well, we're getting that up and running, um, uh, I don't know, uh, can we get, how many people sort of, well, okay, everyone's video is off. I don't know if you can raise hands or something. Do people look at, look at the readings on taxes? They're kind of technical, kind of a slog, um, but all uh, fairly important stuff. Can any, I don't know, wave your hand if your video's on, if you, okay, I'm seeing a few hands getting waved. So uh, there are a few concepts um, that are like very key to thinking about taxes. And the first one, um, in a way maybe the most important one is, is the idea of the tax base. And the tax base is just the thing you're taxing. Um, and so it's important to have the notion of the tax base in mind because typically in discussions of like raising taxes or progressive taxation, um, people tend to think of a lot of taxes that aren't actually the sort of like main taxes that raise money. So you might think, okay, let's tax pollution or let's tax like luxury jets and other stuff that rich people consume. And that can be an those are taxes that actually raise any money. Uh, New York state brings in about $80 billion a year in tax revenues. And about two thirds of it comes from the personal income tax which is much smaller than the federal income tax. It's around 6%, uh, but that's where like most of the money is coming from. The other tax that brings in uh, like the second largest amount of money is the sales tax. Um, at the federal level, again, the income tax is like over half of federal tax revenues. Um, the corporate tax used to be a bigger part of uh, overall tax revenues. Now it's sort of small, it's around like 10%. Um, and so that means that when we look at changing uh, tax policy, we have to look to the income tax. Uh, we would like to uh, increase the amount of revenues that we get from corporate taxes, but those are all different tax bases. So, um, sorry, uh, Jeremy, do you have the link I sent? No, I didn't get it, but is it just the regular slideshow? I have yeah, that. you can do the regular, anyone you can do, honestly. There are like 40 versions. Um, okay, here we go. Uh, so the, so the, the proposal we, oh great. Uh, we always say that our tax proposals fall into three general categories, uh, income, wealth, and businesses. And um, those are like, three major tax bases, right? You tax individual incomes. Uh, wealth or people's net assets are not something that's really taxed under an income tax. And so we also have to think about taxes on accumulated wealth. And then businesses are sort of their own domain of taxation. So, all right, let's start to go through the slides and uh, skip the first few. So we always give this pitch and we say, you know, look, there's this big sort of economic disaster. All right, let's stop here. Um, Obviously the state has lost a lot of money during the pandemic because anytime there's uh, you know, an economic shutdown or a recession and people are losing their jobs, they're getting paid less and they're spending less. And so those major sources of revenue, the income tax and the sales tax decrease. Uh, now, as it turns out, the state hasn't lost quite as much money as it expected because so many white collar professionals have been able to work from home uh, and keep earning their high salaries. 
but there is a real budget problem. And so we say, you know, obviously that's going to hurt people and there will be these sort of disastrous cuts, but what's New York's real ability to remedy that? And so uh, this is the like big picture economic framing of talking about the sort of macro limits on our ability to raise taxes. And we say, what does New York look like if you treat its economy as that of a separate country? And it's actually enormous. New York's GDP is about 1.8 trillion per year. So that makes it around like the 10th largest economy in the world, if you treat it as a separate country. Only in the US, only California and Texas are bigger. California would be like the fifth largest country in the world. Uh, and one, and a sort of, in a way, the best, the best means of sort of gauging how much an economy is burdened by taxation in the sense that taxes are being taken out of the economy, they're a burden on economic activity, is to say, well, sort of what percent of that GDP of the whole economy is being extracted in taxes. And it, it's not going to be that high, as you might guess. Um, but this chart shows that not only is New York's economy uh, very large, but it's actually also pretty big on a per person basis. It's like on, you know, on a per person basis, this is a richer economy than most of the Scandinavian countries, maybe all of them. Uh, so in other words, we can really afford to finance a welfare state just given the resources of the state economy. So that's like the first step. Um, next slide. So this shows what I was just describing, which is tax burden. Okay, how much of the economy is being taken out in taxes? And this compares New York State to sort of other comparable economies. So not just uh, advanced social democracies, but also Canada, Australia, and the UK. You can see that we have a relatively low tax burden, uh, which means that you could raise it and there wouldn't really be a strong case that that's economically harmful because it would still be comparably burdened to these other pretty successful major developed economies. Next slide. This shows, so the headline of our campaign is like raise $50 billion. And that's because we estimate that our proposals can bring in about 50 to $70 billion in new revenues. So that's only about 4% of GDP. I mean, 4% of GDP is, a, is a, that's huge actually, but uh, that's a very sort of manageable increase in the state tax load that would match us to Canada. Next slide. Next slide, Jeremy. Okay, so this part we can skip through. I'm sure you all know it. The rich are like capturing most economic growth. Wages have been stagnant, so on and so forth. This is a little bit um, less familiar perhaps, but Wall Street didn't used to be nearly as big as it is today. This, it's always been like very much sort of iconically New York and, and lucrative, but um, the whole sort of fixation that we currently have on like the stock market and the financial sector, relatively recent. Um, and the financial industry is relatively undertaxed for a number of sort of tax loophole reasons. And also just because um, the sort of tax system hasn't caught up to this explosive growth in the financial sector. Um, okay, next slide. This shows what I was just saying that, you know, the um, sort of amount of trading has just skyrocketed since the sort of beginning of the neoliberal era. And let's go on. Our budget's too small. Okay, now's the time to tax the rich. And everybody wants to tax the rich. All right, uh, so now we get into the actual tax stuff. Um, and this is, again, you know, different, we've done this for a lot of different groups. Everybody sort of has a different interest in actually knowing what's in here. But I think this is really like extremely important stuff uh, for leftists to know. Um, because it's very hard, like with taxes in particular, it's very hard to say hold legislators feet to the fire if you don't sort of have any specificity in the demand. Um, that's not always the case, right? There are other sort of political domains where you can just demand certain reforms at a low degree of specificity. Um, I'm not recommending that, it's just possible in other contexts um, that if you make the demand and you mobilize people, something gets done. Um, taxes, I think, are a little bit different. Uh, you know, people throw out a lot of ideas, they're technical, somebody gets lost in the details, the next thing you know, uh, very little has happened. Um, every every uh, presidential election, you'll hear 
Democratic candidates talking about ending the tax preference for capital gains, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. That, that, that you know, nobody does that. Why? Because it's just something they say in debates. There's not really pressure to, to change those tax preferences. Um, so anyway, going to this slide, we always, there's this adage in the tax policy world, an old tax is a good tax. Um, and there are two ways to, two things to hook onto there. One is that taxes are very complicated. There are always challenges in administering them and making sure that they work. And so you sort of want to use the bones of the existing framework um, rather than trying to do really innovative new stuff. Over-engineering tax policy is sort of a very good way to make more work for tax lawyers and raise less revenue. But it also gets back to what I was saying about the tax base, that there are sort of a few different fundamental tax bases, like individual incomes, business incomes, corporate incomes. And you basically want to tax those tax bases. If you have a really narrow tax, like something that's been proposed that you may have read about is the tax on second luxury homes in New York, those tend to, you know, that, so that's, that's not like rich people's second homes is not a tax base. That's like a narrow part of the property tax base. And those kinds of taxes, uh, well, there are a lot of issues with them. Among other things, they tend to not raise much money. So that's why everything in this, in this whole framework has just been focused on raising as much money as possible. If, uh, if any of you read the chapter, which is I think a pretty good chapter in the TR Read book called um, BBLR, Broad Base Low Rates, is that by expanding the base as much as possible, you can get more compliance raise more, and raise more revenue with lower overall tax rates. And it's better for the economy because it's less distortionary. All right, so moving on, what's actually in the package? Here's the next slide. Uh, next slide. All right, uh, as I said, we say that th there are really three categories here. One, you gotta tax incomes because as it turns out, high income earners are undertaxed in this state, but also because the income tax, really important tax base. Two, the income tax doesn't get it accumulated wealth. It just doesn't tax it. So both out of political concerns about uh, massive accumulations of wealth and for revenue purposes, we wanna have wealth taxes. And those really take two forms. One, um, a wealth tax, like, you know, 1% of your wealth gets taxed. Turns out that's actually unconstitutional in New York state. So we think that should be changed. But also um, estate taxes and inheritance taxes, those are really wealth taxes. They're, they're wealth transfer taxes. So they only um, take effect at the time of death or when assets are passed on, but that's what they're taxing. They're taxing wealth. Uh, and then those two categories of income and wealth, those are taxes on people. Uh, they don't tax businesses, but it's important to tax businesses. Um, there's in the Saez and Zuckman reading, again, I don't really care if anybody did the readings, but I'm just gonna reference them. And then if maybe you can go back and read it. Um, they talk about the difference between burdening labor and capital. So uh, when you or I pay tax and it comes out of our paycheck, uh, you know, we are the production factor that we are as workers or employees is labor. It's our income from labor that's um, getting taxed and paying the tax. But suppose you tax a corporation on its profits. This is actually contested, but uh, there are good reasons to think that the tax gets paid out of profits that would go to shareholders. So who are shareholders? Well, shareholders really represent capital because that's just you know, accumulated wealth that has been invested in a corporation. And now it's bearing the burden of taxation because the corporation's profits are getting taxed. So there's a sort of a big debate about how much do you want to tax labor and how much do you want to tax capital? As you can imagine, we generally should support taxes on capital. Uh, and also in this category is a tax on, is what's called a financial transactions tax. So that's a tax on every individual financial transaction. These actually exist all over the world. We'll talk about it more in a moment, but um, that's a good way to get it both to sort of really outsize profitability of the financial sector and to discourage certain forms of like unproductive um, financial trading. Now, um, I just wanna see, does anybody have any questions or anybody wanna make any brief comments before we go into more detail here? You can put anything in the chat or just shout out to me. All right. Hearing nothing, let's move on. Yep. 
Are any of these bills actually proposed? Yes, all the bills are drafted and proposed and they're getting um, bill numbers right now. Um, sorry, I, uh, Jer Jeremy, can you talk for a moment? I think my wife got locked out. Uh, sure. <laughs> Jenny, you want to take it? Oh, yes. Hello. Okay. So I will try to take it from here. Uh, or unless there are any questions. So all these are actually proposed. Yes, they have legal language. Um, why is a wealth tax unconstitutional anyway? Well, it's very interesting. It actually goes back to the New York State constitutional amendment process from 1938. Um, apparently the reasoning was that the people, the drafters of the constitutional amendment at the time wanted to make New York State into like a global financial capital. And I guess that's actually what happened. Um, and they saw as a key barrier to that, um, the state potentially having the ability to tax intangible assets. So they specifically carved out the ability to tax intangible assets from the state's powers all the way back in 1938. Um, and it was really interesting because I guess we didn't really know about this. So I mentioned earlier on that there's been many iterations of this campaign. Um, in last year's iteration of that, this campaign, we actually didn't know about this constitutional amendment until very late in the legislative process. Um, the original intent was to have a real wealth tax as we're trying to do now through a constitutional amendment. Um, it wasn't until late in the process that we realized it wasn't constitutional to just tax all wealth and levy a tax on the total sum of wealth. As Bernie said, there is Elizabeth Warren have proposed the federal level. Um, so that was like a fun thing to find. Um, Jenny, I'm back by the way. Okay, great. I, I just asked the I just answered the unconstitutional question. I don't know if you want to okay. take the next one. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know whether the question was like, what's the historical explanation or what's the legal explanation, but it's 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 literally just prohibited by the state constitution. Um, you may have heard that a wealth tax is um, um, you know uh, prohibited by the U.S. Constitution, and that's actually very different because there's a real interpretive question there about what some really old words mean and whether wealth tax is a direct tax. Um, it's very different in the case of New York State. New, New York State, it's a more recent um, provision of the constitution. It's like very clear. Um, so somebody says, when we broaden the base, we have to make sure not to turn potential allies against us. So that's an interesting comment because generally, I think base broadening actually has the opposite effect. Um, what you don't wanna do is say, only impose an income tax on certain professions that you think are bad professions, like maybe tax lawyers, and then let everybody else off the hook. Um, and the reason is that one, it's like very economically distortionary. You really don't want people making decisions for tax reasons. Um, two, those kinds of policies rarely work. They create a lot of avoidance problems. Um, three, uh, they don't raise money. I don't know whether I already said that. One place this actually came up was with the so-called pied terre tax on luxury homes, because targeting the uh, like second and third luxury properties that are worth many millions of dollars in New York City would seem like the most politically uncontroversial tax that you could have, because it only targets like it, you know, and sort of especially the way it's represented is that this is like a tax on like Russian billionaires who are laundering their money by buying up fancy penthouses in New York City. But recently, some of the uh, building trades unions came out against it because they said, this is going to hurt us. Uh, you know, yeah, maybe it's like the penthouses of uh, these foreign billionaires, but like we're the ones who build them and our, our jobs come from uh, those, um, those projects. So actually, base broadening can be a very good way to forge alliances because it doesn't really target anybody. It's built on certain just fundamental principles like corporations should pay taxes. Um, we'll talk about what progressivity means now, because that is the kind of, uh, you know, fine tuning that you want in tax rates. So going to the income tax, and this is really the biggest category, um, a progressive income tax is one that just generally burdens higher income taxpayers in a fair way. 
So to get a sense of what that means, imagine a flat tax of 10%. And this notion of progressivity, like it, it might be the most important tax policy concept to really have a handle on uh, for our purposes. So you imagine a flat tax of 10%, somebody earning $50,000 pays $5,000 in tax, and somebody earning a million dollars pays $100,000 in tax. And so a lot of people intuitively think, oh, well, that's a fair tax if it's flat because the rich pay more. The problem is that that's not a fair distribution of the tax burden, because if you're a lower income taxpayer and you pay 10% of your income, all that money would have gone to basic living expenses, to sort of fundamental savings. And so it's either data, it's either decreasing your day to day, like basic necessary consumption, or it's coming out of fairly fundamental and necessary uh, savings and investment. Whereas if you're earning, I mean, a lot of people in the state earn a million dollars a year. But if you're earning a million dollars a year, that's like an insane amount of money, right? That doesn't make you a millionaire. That makes you really, really rich. And so after paying 10% tax, you have $900,000 left over. I mean, you are far beyond covering your basic costs of living. Like rent is not an issue. Uh, instead, you have a high capacity for luxury and consumption. And really, you're probably saving and investing a considerable amount of money. So the burden of that 10% flat tax is really very low for somebody who makes that kind of money whereas it's relatively higher for somebody who's a lower or middle income uh, earner. And so progressive tax says, okay, well, to sort of distribute that burden fairly, let's turn up the rates on people who earn more money. So maybe the, so the person earning a million dollars, they should be paying like 50% tax or 60% tax. That starts to look like a more fair distribution of the tax burden than the flat rate. So with that in mind, and this is how the federal income tax works. The federal income tax is actually relatively progressive. Um, if you're on the low end, it's around like 15%, but the top rate is now 37%. And until before Trump cut it, it was just about 40%. So go to, let's go to the next slide and see what things are actually like in New York, um, because it's actually fairly surprising. So if you were to look at it on paper, you'd say, oh, the New York tax rate goes from 4% to almost 9%. Well, that's true, but it's kind of misleading because there are all all these really low rate brackets. So if you look at this chart, which is full of numbers, but you go to the left. So that's, those are the tax rates for single filers. And you go down to the bottom, you can see that it, the top tax rate increases to over 6% for somebody making $20,000. And that top bracket of about 8.8%, that's for somebody making over a million dollars. So if you make basically between $20,000 and a million dollars a year, your tax rate varies by about half a percent. We approximately have a flat income tax in New York state. And to give you an idea, I mean, sort of the $800,000, $900,000 range, which until we got involved is never raised as a group to, to um, raise income taxes on, that's like a lot of investment bankers and private equity guys. I mean, often they sort of are making a few hundred thousand dollars in base salary with like a half million dollar bonus in a good year. And when you hear Cuomo or even a lot of legislators saying about raising taxes on the rich, they'll say, oh, we'll raise taxes on somebody making a million dollars a year or $5 million a year. And you're just leaving a ton of money on the table and not doing anything about this really high degree of unfairness in the tax system. All right, so uh, next slide, we have some uh, graphical representations of this. We talk about how much um, money it's gonna bring in, but basically we say, but the sort of principle here should be uh, this, these tax increases kick in around $300,000 for a single individual and around $450,000 in income for a married couple. And it should go up gradually with every $100,000 of additional income. Straightforward or not. All right, um, that just shows what it looks like when it's graphed. Let's uh, go on. Uh, we talk about what it means in dollar amounts. It's not that burdensome, but we can uh, move past that. Because uh, on the next slide, there's a very important sort of second half of the story to uh, what's going on in the income tax. Uh, oh, good. Somebody asked if these are proposed marginal tax rates. Uh, yes, these are, these are generally marginal tax rates. There's, there's some funky detail in how the state income tax works, but bottom line is yes. Um, so if you have, in, so there's income from work, and there's also uh, income from investing. The sort of formal name for that is capital gains. But basically, 
uh, you can make your money from getting a salary, like as an employee, or you can also, uh, you know, in tax terms, you can also earn your income by just investing in the stock market and then selling off all the assets um, that you buy, like your stocks and your bonds. Uh, those stocks and bonds are called capital assets. And when you sell them, you get taxed on the profit that you make from your investments, and that's called capital gains. Capital gains for a very long, since really the, the beginnings of the income tax um, around uh, the World War I era, they've been taxed at a much lower rate than wage income or what's called ordinary income. G generally the preference for the top uh, tax brackets is um, they come in at about half the rate. That's a little bit different now, but um, because of an Obamacare tax, but um, you know, basically under Obama, the top tax rate was 40% on your wage income and 20% on your capital gains. So as you would guess, it's mostly very well-to-do people who have a meaningful amount of investment income. But more than that, a lot of billionaires pretty much only have capital gains because what they do is they basically are investors. So Warren Buffett would always say that he pays a lower tax rate than his secretary. And the reason is that you know, again, before this smaller Obamacare tax, if you're, no matter how much you have in investment income, and let's say it's, you know, 2012, um, your top tax rate, no matter what, is 20%. That's about the top tax rate on somebody earning 50 to $60,000 a year. Uh, this has often been rationalized as sort of a way of incentivizing investment. As I mentioned before, you can listen for it in any presidential debate, you'll hear Democrats saying, oh, and we're gonna end the capital gains preference. We're gonna equalize tax treatment. They don't do it. Uh, there are huge constituencies that are very attached to this tax preference and nobody else thinks about it really, you know, unless you're getting capital gains or you're like a tax policy guru, it, you're just not really thinking about it. Okay, so what does that bring us to? We say, and this is um, sort of a provocative idea. We say, you know, that's bad federal tax policy. We can't do anything about the federal laws at the state level, but why not offset them? You know, why not just have New York State basically reverse really regressive federal tax policy at the state level? And so this bill adds a higher income tax rate on capital gains that basically just wipes out the federal preference. If the federal rate goes up, our rate goes down. And today, everybody in New York is paying the same tax rate on their income, whether it's from working or investing. Um, next slide. This is a very progressive proposal. Um, it overwhelmingly hits the top 1% and really top 10th of a percent of taxpayers. Uh, okay, any more, we're about to go on to wealth taxes. So any more questions, comments? Anybody totally zoned out? Um, all right, feel free to send them. But uh, so this is income. Now let's talk about wealth. Wealth is a little bit different because um, wealth tax is one they don't raise as much money as income taxes. Like it's just not on the same scale. That should be changed, but it's hard to change. Um, however, the system for taxing inherited wealth has really been very hollowed out um, in relatively recent history. So the way this has always worked is uh, Generally, there's a tax on an estate at death. So you amass a bunch of assets over the course of your life, you die, they go to your kids. And uh, in general, there's been a sort of policy of exempting the first X number of dollars of that estate from tax. And for a long time, like up really until 2000, it was less than a million dollars. And uh, you know, it doubles if you have a married couple. So the married couple, they pass on, they have like maybe $5 million in assets. and uh, you know, under say the end of the Clinton administration, um, they would exempt the first, you know, 1.3 some odd million dollars from tax. And then they pay a state tax on any amounts over that. So that exemption amount has shot up just in the past 20 years. And Trump pushed it up even further um, to, to levels that are just nuts. So for the federal estate tax, the exemption is now about $23.5 million. So that means there is no tax at all on the first $23.5 million of somebody's estate at the federal level. New York and many other states have sort of followed that about halfway. So the New York exemption is about $11 million for a married couple. So 
that is <laughs> there's some really rich people but there are not many people who like die with assets over 11 million dollars so the whole that there's a long history of just sort of this whole policy of taxing estates getting totally hollowed out and it's really due to the success of conservative activists who simply are opposed to taxing intergenerational wealth transfers ironically there's not a lot of support for this I mean, there's not a lot of support for that conservative policy among conservative economists, because you could be a really right wing economist who thinks, well, we shouldn't really have taxes because taxes discourage people from working. I want to go start a business, but I'm going to have to pay taxes on what I earn from my business. And that's a disincentive. And we want to incentivize people to go, you know, start businesses. OK, that's probably not correct, but like that's an argument that conservative economists make. And to start, like if the tax rates were 100%, you know, it would discourage people from starting up businesses. There's not really a comparable argument against the estate tax, because the only way that would work is if the whole reason that I was accumulating wealth and working was just to pass it on to my kids. But that's really not why people get rich. Uh, in other words, the sort of disincentive effect of an estate tax is very, very low. Uh, so this is not this is not sort of like part of the neoliberal game. I mean, it is insofar as there's conservative politics at work, but it's really in its sort of own category uh, as a policy matter. Um, it's really a sort of right wing cultural uh, politics victory. So anyway, as you'd expect, we say, you know, just at the state level, we should really lock up the system of taxing intergenerational wealth. So we lower that estate tax exemption, but we also impose an inheritance tax. And this is another sort of big like conceptual point. Currently, if you receive a gift or you receive some inheritance, you probably have the intuition that that's not like subject to tax. You know, if you get, if you go work and you get a job, you would think, okay, I have to pay tax on that. But if somebody gives you a gift, if you inherit a lot of money, most people think, well, yeah, I don't have to pay any tax on that. That's not like taxable income. And that's true, but that's only because federal law exempts it. It doesn't have to be that way. And in economic terms, that is income. And once you think of it that way, you realize, okay, so there is inherited income, just like there's investment income and there's wage income. And now you sort of see how upside down the whole tax system is because the highest tax rates are on wage income and there are no taxes on inherited income, which doesn't have anything to do with your work or your merit or any other relevant factor. Um, so if somebody says, what do we want to lower? The exemption to. Um, so here's sort of our framework. We say, um, just like the income tax has those progressive graduated rates, the there should be like an estate tax that exempts the first $750,000 and then has graduated rates above that, an inheritance tax that exempts the first $250,000. These sort of work synthetically with a credit system so you're not double taxing people. Um, and the rates rise to about 50%. Um, so that if you're inheriting $30 million, uh, I mean, you still end up with a lot of money, um, but, 50, but about but half of it goes to the government. And that's sort of a principled view. All right, next slide. Um, yeah, the, you know, this says, look, inheritances are unearned income, gives you the rates. There are some exemptions, if anyone's curious, we don't have to talk about them. It's kind of politically interesting because as we have uh, discussed these proposals with a lot of other organizations, um, this, has, this proposal in particular has gotten the most resistance. Um, people say, oh, well, what about, you know, what about my parents' very valuable home? What about the family farm? Um, there's a strong intuition even among progressives that you shouldn't really be taxing people's inheritances and that if I'm inheriting the $5 million family business, it's not really fair to tax me on that. So DSA has sort of been pushing against that and we've said, look, it's really fair to tax those inheritances, but there are some carve outs and some exemptions because that's sort of how the process works. Um, all right, next slide. Next slide. So now we get to wealth taxes and there's another point to be made here. Um, so we say amend the constitution to a wealth tax, fine. But let's go back to the idea of the tax base. So um, you know, nobody thinks about tax bases, but it's a very helpful question because you say, all right, whenever we're taxing something, what's the tax base? Well, the tax base isn't like rich people. That's not like the thing you're taxing. What are we taxing? Wealth. 
well, what's wealth? Wealth is property. It's, your, it's all the property you own. So what does that sound like? Well, it sounds like the property tax. In other, the point becomes that we essentially have a wealth tax, but it's basically a middle-class wealth tax. If all, the, if all your assets are locked up in real property, which is the case for most you know, middle-class families, then the, the property taxes you pay are in effect a wealth tax. Your net wealth, getting taxed by the state. But if all your, if all your uh, net worth is locked up in um, your investment portfolio or in uh, corporate stock, um, because you know, you're Bill Gates, it, it's, it is unconstitutional in this state to tax it. And so the wealth tax is actually just a sort of a, a holistic expanded property tax. All right. Uh, next slide. All right, so now we're into our business taxes category. As I mentioned, the financial sector, hugely bloated. Um, you know, we all think of it as sort of causing boom and bust cycles, as massively overcompensating people. And increasingly, there's really good research that says large financial sectors that are really overdeveloped are sort of a drain on the economy. And you can understand that concretely in the sense that uh, if you have, you know, a lot of very talented, highly educated people going into an industry that's essentially speculative, rather than going into more productive sectors of the economy, it's basically bad for everyone. And so a tax on financial transactions is intended both to raise a lot of money off of this super lucrative sector and to cut down on speculation and sort of cut down on the profitability of this crazy, crazy industry. Okay. Uh, and, oh, and last thing, it covers, this is a sort of tax that covers all instruments. So Again, you know, the idea of the tax base, what does it apply to? Stocks, bonds, derivatives, sort of anything you could think of. Um, you may have heard about the stock transfer tax. People talk about that. There's sort of a popular, so that's a tax that New York had from 1905 to 1981. Uh, and if you, if you traded stocks in this uh, state, you had to pay a little tax on it. Um, and it's still collected and rebated. So computers nominally collect it at the New York Stock Exchange. But it's not, today, the, people like to say, oh, well, let's, let's stop rebating it. Let's reinstate the stock transfer tax. It's already on the books. And that's really the main argument for it. Oh, it's already on the books. We used to have it. But it doesn't really make sense to just tax stocks. You need to tax all the different kinds of financial instruments um, if you're serious about having, having a tax on the financial sector. OK, next slide. So the last thing, and again, this is sort of an important political point. Um, Trump had one legislative accomplishment and it was a huge tax cut. So the US corporate tax rate has been about 35% since the early 90s. Before that, it was higher. Trump cut it to 21%. That is estimated cost about $2 trillion. And he had to do a bunch of other things. Well, he didn't do them, but the bill did a bunch of other things to raise new revenues to try to offset uh, the, the incredible cost of this corporate tax cut. All right, got a little, yep, great. So somebody asks, how does the financial transactions tax affect retirement funds? And uh, so Doug Henwood, I've read some of your stuff, I'm a fan, uh, totally different system. The, the system for um, retirement uh, accounts is basically, um, it, it's, 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 it's not gonna be seriously affected by this. There are uh, big, um, like, I don't know if you know Vanguard or Fidelity, but there are uh, big uh, fund companies that will say, oh, the financial transaction tax, this is a tax on retirement accounts. Uh, this is, at, the good analysis suggests that that is not, not really true. Um, that, that the amount that the trading effects on retirement funds and the way they're managed would be very minimal. Um, and that has to do with the kinds of uh, financial firms that manage them and the sort of structures of the incentives they have. Um, but, but even, actually, if somebody's interested, we can um, find it and share it. There's some Vanguard report that basically said, you know, oh, the FTT, big tax on retirement accounts. And then they sort of showed that all the assumptions they relied on to reach that conclusion were like completely outlandish, utterly disconnected from reality. So... Uh, all right, going back to um, the corporate tax cut. So huge cut in the corporate tax rate, really expensive. And then there was another big cut in there, which is um, not all 
businesses or corporations. A corporation is one kind of legal form, but there are a lot of businesses that simply don't have the legal form of being a corporation. Uh, they're called partnerships or LLCs, joint ventures. In tax terms, that's all one thing, um, but it's they're called pass-through entities where the entity itself, the business doesn't pay any tax. It's only the business owner who pays tax. And there's another provision in this 2017 law that says uh, if you own one of those businesses and you're not, and it, it's and it's basically restricted to like real estate businesses and manufacturing. So there, there is this whole like red state, blue state dynamic. If you're a lawyer or a doctor or even a hedge fund guy, um, you don't get this tax benefit. But if you're in one of these other industries that's sort of you know identified with like red states um, or just Trump friendly, you get a 20% cut off your taxes. A uh, former professor of mine actually called this the worst idea ever even seriously proposed in the whole history of tax policy. The reason is that you get your business income just from say running a real estate business. I am a say highly compensated employee. You make the same amount of money, but now your taxes have gone down 20% because of this law. It's, it's really a sort of arbitrary deduction. It's crazy. Um, and it's like literally a handout to real estate magnets. You get a bigger tax benefit if you just own more property. So as we talked about with the capital gains tax, the, that income tax offset, with the corporate tax cuts, we would do the same thing. Raise corporate taxes in New York State, reverse all this terrible stuff that's going on at the federal level, uh, and they're synchronized. So if uh, federal rates went back up, these rates would go down, but we'd still be bringing in a lot of money. All right. I hope nobody's fallen asleep. Um, that was very long, I realize. But um, we have covered really these sort of fundamental categories of taxation, the basic tax bases, the, the taxes that really bring in money. And as I said, we've given this sort of talk to a lot of different groups. And we've said every time, look, it's important that everybody actually sort of knows what these things are, that they have some basic intuitive sense of why we need a progressive income tax or what it means to raise the corporate tax because we really have to put pressure um, both on, we, well, we have to put pressure on all elected representatives. But we also have to sort of develop a campaign that can be articulated by our own left-wing representatives um, to really specifically attack these issues. And that's what they're doing right now. So we've been routinely briefing all these, all our DSA electeds to say, here's how it works. Here's what you should go advocate for. Here are the bills. Here's why this way. Um, you know, stick to uh, your fellow legislators and show why we need to do this. Um, and so far, I mean, who knows how it's going to go? But uh, it's been a lot more successful than we expected it would be. Um, so okay. I'm going to hand the ball over to oh, okay. Ashley to start moderating Q and A. Yeah. I think we have, we definitely have time for some Q&A, maybe some breakout groups, depending on how the group is feeling. Go for it, Ashley. Unmute myself. Um, yeah, we're just gonna, I'm just gonna run through really quickly some community agreements so we all can make sure that we're being respectful. Just, I think where most of us are familiar, one man, one mic, or one person, one mic, um, not over talking anyone. Um, be mindful how much, uh, how many questions you're asking, how much time you take up. How much space you're taking up in your answers and comments. Um, let's assume good intentions of everybody. If there's anything that you disagree with or that you might find to be factually incorrect, just and people make mistakes. So let's just assume the best intentions of everyone. Um, and yeah, let's all just be respectful, kind, compassionate, and have good conversation. So if you have any um, comments or you want to ask a question, use the comment section to write back. Um, and Jeremy, are you moderating or? My moderating. Oh, oh, me? Okay. Um, okay, so we're going to open the floor to anyone that has questions for Nathan now. Uh, Doug, go ahead. Hi. Um, thank you for doing that. Very informative. Um, I have actually two questions. One is like, where'd that number come from? 50 to 75 billion. Are you assuming no changes in behavior? What kinds of it? Will people run out of town? Will they move their uh, transactions offshore? You know, are, is this money actually available? And the other question is based on a um, opinion piece that a Financial Times co columnist Janan Ganesh wrote about a year ago. And he said, uh, there's something about relying on taxing the rich rather than a broader tax on everyone. Uh, 
that is kind of magical. Um, it's as if you want to have a welfare state that is valuable only insofar as someone else pays for it. It's not an inherent good. It's not a nation's binding agent. The idea is a concession to the Reagan view of the world, which is that taxes a burden and not uh, what we pay for a civilized society. It's less the universalism and solidarity than the noblesse oblige of remote overclass, which will not miss the money. What about the politics of that? It's, it's, it doesn't evoke kind of solidarity that um, a broader tax would, uh, in which we're all taking care of each other. Um, so thanks for that. I, I love that question, actually, because um, there were a few things I meant to say at the outset, which I had dropped. Um, but I think um, that's exactly the right question to ask. And so here, that's what I'd say about it. First of all, um, this is, even though our campaign, well, there are actually a lot of different campaign names, but one of the campaign names is tax the rich. And these are generally taxes on the rich. It is framed a little bit differently um, from say what you might've heard of as the ultra millionaires tax um, and you know, scrutinized any of these positions can be defended basically as fair, as a sort of properly progressive uh, tax policy that fairly distributes the tax burden. So the argument has not just been, um, you know, make the rich pay for the rest of us. It's, this is actually what an equitable tax policy uh, looks like. And actually the rich are relatively undertaxed. Um, to the broader point, um, I sort of see a few sides to it. One, um, because of the degree of inequality and because of um, you know, the, the way that in so many forms the rich are undertaxed, um, you know, you've got you've to tax, you've got to raise taxes on the rich and the wealthy um, to, get, to get this off the ground. But more broadly, I do agree that we need to, um, you know, we shouldn't say like taxes are bad, uh, only the rich should pay taxes. We're sort of very pro-tax. I always say like, you know, everyone, like people should pay taxes. If you have a small income, you pay a little bit in taxes, but uh, taxes aren't bad. And it's very important to be upfront about that. Um, generally, you, the sort of strategy of liberal um, rhetoric and policy on taxes for many decades has been to act like tax one, to act like you're not taxing anybody, to always talk about closing loopholes and ending benefits for the rich. And it's actually, it's pretty much just loopholes because they want to say they're raising taxes. And I think that that avoids a very necessary discussion about how taxes are important and how it actually is okay to sort of have a broad contribution to the tax base. It just has to be equitable. And that means progressive. Um, there's a, a recently deceased uh, tax scholar named uh, Ed Kleinbard, though, who, who made a very useful distinction between um, progressive taxation and progressive fiscal policy. He'd say, look, you can have a progressive income tax, but what we really want is a wholly progressive fiscal system. So a good example of that would be if you had a regressive tax to pay for Medicare for all, it would still be progressive fiscal policy. Everybody would be better off even though the tax itself isn't progressive. Okay, so that's important to keep in mind and we should all sort of stay oriented around that objective that it's not just about only taxing the rich. But like I said, I think this is a, a fair tax policy and, and that we do have to, have to confront um, the fact that the rich are undertaxed. And what about uh, evasion, moving to Florida or moving the trading off to the, an island offshore? Oh, right, so on your first question, yeah. Um, you know, we, we've assumed a certain degree of behavioral adjustments, not huge. Um, there's honestly not a tremendous amount of data on um, moving in response to taxes, though the good studies, it's mostly this book by this guy, um, Cristobal Young, um, show that the, the rich are relatively immobile, um, both for the reason that uh, the rich are sort of like you and I and people move, rich people like everyone else, they move for jobs and family and community and geography and not really because of taxes, but they're also not like you and I in that uh, they tend to be immobilized by their success. So you're a very successful financial professional or um, 
you know, attorney in New York City and you have a whole network of connections and clients and professional relationships that you kind of depend on uh, for your success and you can't really port those over to uh, Montana or some super low tax jurisdiction. Um, businesses are a little bit different, but because of the way the corporate tax works, there are also good reasons to think that um, there aren't really incentives in the, or the, the tax code would really disincentivize um, leaving, that it would always really be a net sort of revenue loss to move your business out of state just to avoid the taxes. Thanks, Nathan. Um, next, we're going to Lee. Um, yeah, hey, how you doing? So I actually have two, two, two points. One is um, just to go back to the broad and the base question. Um, and when you talk about the family business, the family farm, that's what the right wing always talks about is, okay, you know, if, if, if a family farm is, goes from one generation to the next and it's taxed to the point where, you know, the, it goes out of business, they have to sell it, then there's no more family farm. And of course that doesn't really apply that much in New York City, but what does apply is the two family home you know, once you get out into the, the lettered streets, Avenue S, Avenue T, you know, um, the overwhelming amount of homes are two family homes. And those are usually bought by a working class family. And then, um, you know, then they rent one of the houses and that's what pays the uh, mortgage. And whereas I agree with the general point you're making and the point Doug made that we want to tax wealth in general, we don't, I don't think we want to make it such that people have to sell the family home um, for, uh, to pay the taxes when the time goes. If we do that, we turn a lot of people against us. So that's just a political point. Um, but the second point I think it is, is if you look at New York, city, New York state, um, the general mm, income, I mean, there are a lot of poor people here, but there's a lot of middle-class people. And those middle-class people, some of them are traditional middle-class people, but some are, are the work, you know, what they used to call the aristocracy of labor, the electricians, the, you know, the skilled trades. And, um, and in New York City, it's, it's part of the class struggle that's been waged here for many, many years that there's been a development of a working middle class that makes money. And, and that's what causes a wealthy state and a wealthy state raises a lot of taxes. So I, I, I think, like personally, I think increasing the minimum wage is one of the best things you can do to raise, help raise taxes. Increasing the rate of pay for the majority of working people, um, that has to be really part of what we say is what, what makes a, you know, a strong state that can pay for um, our programs. And we should pay for our programs because they're the right thing to do, not because we've created some you know, free ride by some tax tricksterism. Yeah, on the first question, there are, so just technically, um, our proposals have liquidity provisions so that if you inherit even sort of a substantial amount of illiquid assets like a family home or um, a family farm, say, and or even to a degree of family business, um, and you would, and the only way to pay the tax is to sell that asset then you can defer it. So you're not exempted from the tax, but you can just defer paying the tax until you actually sell the asset. Um, and the second point, um, I, I agree with all that. I, I, if there was a question, I missed it, but um, I agree about, you know, it goes right to the point about the tax base that um, you know, the middle-class income tax base is a very important source of revenue that like Doug said, it's not, you know, it's not just about taxing the rich. Okay, um, next we have Lenny. Uh, hey, uh, so I have a quick question, I guess, um, to your point about the estate tax, there was a, I, I'm, you said it was like a very highly 
I guess, like contested one. It's probably one of those, the more contested ones out of the bills that you're talking about. And I was wondering if uh, what consideration was made for like, I understand philosophically and like logically, it, I, it makes sense to me, but comparing it to multi-generational wealth versus like, let's say a first generation immigrant family who moved here, like achieved that like immigrant, immigrant, immigrant dream or, or whatever it was, achieved that wealth and wants to then like pass it on to the children that they've like brought on. So it's like that first generation immigrant versus like multi-generation sort of like wealth. Like, I guess, what was the consideration for that for, for this uh, wealth tax? Or sorry, the estate tax you're talking about. Yeah, frankly, that doesn't enter into it at all. I mean, first of all, you're talking about a tax that only applies, you know, literally once in a generation. Um, I think trying to structure it that way would probably be infeasible. Um, it, I don't think I don't think there are any um, wealth transfer taxes that like exempt, say, the first generation. I, I have no idea how you do that. Yeah. I also think that just on on equity grounds, that would not not be good policy. Well, I guess I was more so not like making it so that's the policy, but has it been considered like breaking it down to see if like how it affects um, multi generation versus affecting first first generation? Like, I guess when you like look to see how much revenue it brings in or how it like affects the different like demographics. I don't, I, I, I'm not aware of any research on that. Um, it's even even getting sort of basic data on um, who is affected by the estate tax has been sort of challenging. I would I'd be very surprised if that level of detail were available. Um, it's an interesting question, but I've, I've never heard any sort of analysis of it. Cool, thank you. Okay, next we have Paul. Uh, in the interest of gender parity, if you skip me and come back to me when maybe more non-male participants have had the floor. Um, yes, keep that's a great point. Stack. Yeah, keep me on stack, but you know, go to somebody else. Perfect, Carrington. Um, hi, thank you so much for your presentation. It was really informative and there, there was a lot of information. I'm so sorry if you covered this at all, but it's part of the campaign, the tax rich campaign, does it include like a Piada Ter tax? And is that a significant uh, um, source of income? Because uh, it seems to me there's quite a few very, very expensive Piada Ter jobs. So there are quite a few what? Oh, very expensive Piata tears around. I think of like the needle yeah. building. Isn't that like um, just investment properties? Yeah, that. so this is, so um, sort of always comment on the Piata tears. So it's not part of the package. Um, it, it sort of had its own life and it actually got sort of killed due to certain um, union opposition um, in the building trades, but it's also, has frankly fairly low revenue estimates um, in like the hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, everything we're proposing works on the order of you know, billions of dollars. Um, and even though you could look at Manhattan real estate and think there are some like extremely valuable properties here, um, because the tax base for that is so small, it, it doesn't really bring in a ton of money. Okay, thank you. Um, in the in the interest of being um, progressive stack, I'm gonna go to Ob first before you, Paul. So Ob, go ahead. Hi. So um, I, I'm not sure if you covered this, but um, I'm interested in knowing how how much should we fear something like capital flight? Sure. Yeah, that, well, that's always the question. It's always the threat. Um, you know, Cuomo says it, rich people say it, the business press says it. Um, there are, so if we sort of break it down, um, there, there are the data, the research that has been done on migration and response to taxes suggests that really people don't move for tax reasons. Um, so there's a sort of empirical side to that, the intuitive explanation, um, is just that one, uh, rich people move for the same reasons other people move, which is family, schools, connections, geography, maybe they're looking for work. Um, it's very hard to move for tax reasons. And then it turns out for the rich, it's actually especially hard to move for tax reasons because their success depends very much on sort of local networks that they've built up, their reputation, their client base, and, and those are not very portable. So in terms of like income taxes, say, 
um, it's, it's not a huge concern. There are also business taxes, and so that raises sort of different capital flight concerns. But um, just so you know, the way that the corporate tax works is essentially a corporation reports all of the income that they earn in the country, and then they allocate a certain amount of it to New York State uh, using a formula. And the formula that they use is based on basically how much they're selling into the state. So there's sort of a structural reason why um, they, the calculation there would, would be like moving their employees or moving an office out of the state, it wouldn't really change their tax burden. They would just have to do a lot less business in the state in order for their taxes to go down. And so in most cases, that's really gonna be um, irrational. They're still gonna make money even with higher taxes. And so they'll continue to do business in New York state. Um, I'm gonna put myself in stack for a second. Uh, I'm curious uh, how you guys have considered both the kind of like, um, I've read some articles that have argued or, or pointed out that um, thousands of people have been leaving New York City annually and we just had a chunk of wealthier people leave and that now the projection of how desirable living in a large city is post COVID um, is changing. Um, in addition to like, I think there are a lot of people have just gone to more affordable places, et cetera. So given where we are with COVID and this economic crisis and maybe how things are changing and have been changing, would changes in the tax income tax rates affect us negatively or in, in ways that maybe you didn't anticipate when you started this project? Yeah, that's definitely been a sort of common like observation, you know, isn't everything different now post COVID? Um, there's no, there's no real answer to that in the sense of without being able to predict the future, who knows what will happen. Um, say it, it looks like, and this is not, you know, any sort of expert opinion, but um, it looks like New York is going to be okay. Uh, there are a lot of people who are also moving back, a lot of people who moved to the burbs and then said, what the hell did I do? Um, one, th there is sort of a, a technical thing to know here though. Um, and it's in tax terms, it's called New York's source income. So what is New York tax under the income tax? Well, the tax is income earned by people who are residents in New York. But there's actually another group. Suppose you live in Connecticut and you work on Wall Street. So sort of ordinary intuition, you might think, all right, well, like you live in Connecticut, you get taxed in Connecticut. Uh, you just come to New York to work. But actually any money that you earn in New York is taxed by the state. So for all those people who are moving, they might move out of state, but as long as, there's, as, long as their job is still here, they're still paying taxes to this state. Um, the likelihood that they move somewhere else, but they also like get a job in a different state. I mean, it's low. And if they do it, it's like, it's not going to be for tax reasons. It's, it's really hard <laughs> to just totally change um, your, your career and nobody does it for tax reasons. So I think we feel like that's, that's not a big concern at this point. Uh, if, if things were different and if it looked like everybody was actually just going to spend the rest of their lives on Zoom, then maybe it would be a bigger worry, but I think that that's not how it's going. Okay. All right. We're going to go back to Paul. Okay. Thanks. Um, so first, thanks for the presentation. Um, the Tax the Rich campaign has been one of the most dope things, as the kids say, that we in DSA have done in recent years. Um, so here's some questions, not necessarily for you know, Nathan and the presenters, but for the body to respond to or to ponder offline. So first, does the campaign imply that the state, the government, is not simply and always the executive committee of the bourgeoisie, but something more malleable, a site of power subject to and to some degree a barometer of the balance of class forces. And if the latter, um, what does this say and imply about how a transition to socialism might come about? You know, one bill at a time, one or set of bills at a time, or, you know, it, it, not the big bang, you know, envisioned in other theories of, you know, the socialist uh, transformation. Yeah, it's certainly it's certainly not a big bang. Um, I think I think we all have sort of different um, 
you know, attitudes about this or different um, thoughts. Um, I'd say I, you know, it's possible to maintain a sort of um, dual mindedness about it. Um, we're certainly, so on one hand, you know, it's just the sort of practical presupposition going into something like this that you assume it's possible. Um, and so we approach it as though it's possible. And a lot of people believe it's possible. But it's also, you know, you can also see it as a kind of a structure test. Um, there are a lot of things that the political elites are willing to accommodate that look progressive, but this is obviously a test of something that's fairly fundamental. Um, to the extent that it like forms part of a transitional strategy, um, the ideal case I think looks like you really do have a system of progressive taxation. If you can implement that, it is a like it, it is a direct attack on the power of the wealthy um, in multiple respects, both because it extends the state and the state's fiscal capacity, and because it literally just takes their money away. Um, so, in my view, there's a real potential that that opens the door for a sort of generally more egalitarian, um, you know, sort of economic um, form of social organization and political organization. Um, does that you know? Yeah, it's possible that it just won't succeed at all. My theory will be defeated. Okay, um, next we're gonna go to Jeremy. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, Nathan uh, and Jenny. Both, um, I agree that this is a, an extremely exciting campaign, and that this kind of technical knowledge is worth having and something we as socialists need to get better at. Um, I had a few questions which are mostly actually a little more kind of on the political side of things. Um, one is, I feel like this campaign has, uh, it, it's something that it, it has an issue or a, a kind of question I think about, which is related that a lot of our campaigns have, which is that really to like fulfill in the best way possible um, the kinds of aims we have in these campaigns, we would probably want some of the changes we're pushing for to happen at the federal level, in fact, um, I think like healthcare is another good example where you know we're pushing for the New York Health Act and a state level single payer system. But for various reasons, that is like not ideal, and ideally, it would be happening at the federal level. Um, and so I feel like it's sort of similar for this campaign. And I wonder what you think. I mean, it seems to me there are obvious political reasons to start where we have a foothold, um, which is much more on the state level right now than uh, elsewhere. At, but I wonder what you think about sort of how the, the politics of this um, push at the state level relates to overall federal hopes. What would, you know, the passage of these bills, would they then, you know, if something moved at the federal level, would they be revised? Like what is the kind of linkage between state level politics and federal politics? Um, I guess uh, another question I had also was just about sort of what the political conditions are. So you know, with the campaign, I think the idea again that we have like a foothold in New York state and there is like a significant shift leftward of New York state politics is like a very big political condition that we can take advantage of. But it also seems to me true that periods where there have been kind of this, this um, a, a big expansion of the tax state uh, have often been periods of like a lot of social movement activity as well and organized labor. So like the passing of the income tax in the US was in large part due to the populist movement and insurgency. Um, in Europe, the kind of passing of the taxes that made the welfare state in the mid century, there was huge labor upsurges, a world war, et cetera. So what do you think about sort of the like, um, the, the movement conditions that need to be built that uh, for this kind of wealth confiscation to occur? All right, thanks. So um, two great questions. So the state federal one is one that um, I've given a lot of thought to and is really built into the proposals. Um, you know, as you said, we don't really have, uh, it's like, it's very hard to exert pressure on federal policy, especially federal tax policy. Ideally, most of these changes would take place at the federal level. Um, and that's not a, that's not a political position. You could hate all of these proposals and you'd still say, well, but come on, if you're going to do it, you should do it at the federal level. Um, the concern is that 
uh, it is so easy for basically for the Democrats to sort of weasel out of any commitment to doing anything progressive when it comes to uh, fiscal policy. Um, really, listen, go listen to like any random, um, you know, presidential debate for the Democratic nomination. They'll all talk about the capital gains preference. Um, there are sort of even crazier benefits that the rich get where um, like a lot of taxable gains are just eliminated at death in what's called step up at basis. It's really, really hard to change this stuff. Um, and so there's, a, there's sort of a core political principle here, which says we have a way to exert pressure on those policies through our state legislatures, because anybody would say, well, it's crazy to try to reverse federal policy at the state level, but it's not that crazy. It's better than nothing. And if we do it, it is a way of kind of organizing politically around those issues. Now you have New York state legislators who have views on all this stuff, who make an issue out of it. I mean, there might be other ways, but that's at least one way to sort of say to Democrats at the national level, like, hey, you have to be serious about this. Um, and it, as a technical matter, all like our, our sort of surtaxes or offsets, they really are mechanically offsets. So uh, if the corporate tax rate at the federal level goes up, ours goes down. Uh, it's not just like a fixed percentage increase. So it's very explicit in the policy um, that this is a reversal of federal, uh, regressive federal tax policy. Um, okay, and second one, movement conditions. I mean, you know, that's the big question. Um, I don't think I have anything insightful to say about it. Um, I'd say that uh, I, like, I don't think that you can totally change the tax structure just by convincing everyone that these are good policies and doing a bunch of flyering and then it's done. I mean, you know, you have to have sort of solid traditional like left-wing um, movement building and organizing that has a base in labor. Um, I see the sort of role of this whole exercise, one, as like picking a lot of fights that need to be picked, and two, as like building up the sort of political education apparatus that we didn't already have to say, yeah, and as those movements develop, we can also like concretely and technically focus on what we want to achieve and you know, really highlight the means of achieving uh, those aims. Um, because that's something, you know, that's what we can contribute. Awesome. Next we have Frank. Hi, um, yeah, I guess the, you kind of got at what my question was uh, regarding the political education. More on, on the meta level, like I, I like how the campaign is sort of um, focused on the revenue. Um, and and uh, on the technical question of taxes and not you know how to spend it, it's not like a like a, like I think um, in in uh, Medicare for all there there are tax um, raises, but they're kind of like they're there to uh, to pay for it for uh, Medicare for all or you know another way I could say is like we you could have done instead of a tax the rich campaign a um, you know save the MTA campaign where you're raising you know uh, you know thirty billion dollars to you know, pay off all the debts and, and everything. So um, I was just wondering about um, uh, how the campaign was organized of doing just a revenue versus, um, you know, maybe um, tugging at some heartstrings with yeah. um, saying what you're going to use it for, or is the plan sort of to, you know, hopefully do this and then, and then we can talk about it later, you know, what to do with the money. Well, we didn't do any tugging at heartstrings because I was involved early on and I'm, you know, a cold hearted socialist nerd and I didn't want to do that. Um, it, so, you know, that, that is true, actually. But um, in all seriousness, there have been a lot of different organizations that, uh, you know, obviously, like their whole existence, the, the reason for them to exist is to focus on spending and to talk about spending needs in any uh, and every area of um, the economy and every social issue. And in the past few years, there's been a bit of a convergence around the sort of realization that like revenue is very important, um, which is, you know, completely obvious, <laughs> but also that it becomes um, uh, really politically problematic in certain ways, because when you have limited revenues, it's a very effective tool that the governor can use to pit different progressive organizations against each other because you make them compete for a limited amount of money. 
Um, and their whole campaign has been, you know, we need X dollars to go to uh, our cause. And so now they're fighting with each other. And so we sort of came in and we said, look, you know, one, we know some stuff about taxes. Two, like, what if we just reframe this? What if we actually focus on revenue and we talk about revenue and we talk about taxes um, and the, we don't have earmarked proposals and we just say, let's raise as much money as possible. And there, it's intuitively a little bit funny because you'd say, okay, well, like, look, what matters is spending, right? So we should talk about spending and taxes support spending. And it feels like it's backwards to just talk about taxes, but it's actually been pretty successful in uh, basically unifying a lot of different groups who all say, oh yeah, you know, you're right. Let's think about the money. And then uh, we say, look, we need $50 billion in revenue. And even though we are sort of working on the spending needs, it sort of everybody gets it they say oh yeah that makes sense we need like massive investment in you know repairing our infrastructure and fixing the subway and fixing the schools and fixing public housing and paying for health care um and, and so i'd say it's been like politically it's been, been fairly successful at uh, you know as like an explicit aim unto itself um, I put myself on stack. Um, I asked this question, and I, I think uh, Lee kind of touched on this, but I just kind of want to reiterate. Um, what would be the impact of this overall tax policy? I guess, especially with the inheritance tax, but in general, what is the relationship between this policy change and the real estate market? I know most people don't have access to real estate in New York, but as Lee mentioned, you know, people that have inherited homes but are middle class and wouldn't really be able to pay. I think your answer to him was something um, to the effect of um, liquidation in the event that they would not be able to pay. So it seems like, um, well, and you can correct me, but it seems like, is there a way for middle class people who wouldn't be able to afford taxes on their inheritance to keep their properties? Or would this be kind of a shift in the direction where it's just kind of something that people can't hold on to if they can't afford to pay? Okay, well, I'm, I'm glad you asked that, that question again, because um, I, I probably uh, used the wrong word. I said we had liquidity provisions, which is exactly the opposite, actually. So that says, okay, if you inherit illiquid assets, if you, if you have to sell it to pay the tax, you don't have to sell it. You can just wait until you sell it and pay the tax later. Um, and there are also, there's like a two, there's basically, there's like a, essentially a $2 million exemption in the proposal. Um, so that any, anybody who really is inheriting like a middle-class household um, is, is not paying tax on it. Um, and I think Shen had a question. Hey, yeah. Um, my question is just, there were any, points, uh, sort of like counterpoints that you find are brought up uh, common, uh, common ones? And what is your response to them? You don't have to like, you know, go over the ones that you already covered. Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, there's a lot of people ask questions about the inheritance tax. Um, the other big questions are really, um, you know, income tax, won't the rich leave? We talked about that. Corporate tax, won't businesses leave? We talked about that. It is a pretty high corporate tax increase, to be honest. Um, the sort of argument for it is that's the same corporate tax rate as they were paying in 2017. Um, so they can obviously handle it. Um, uh, what else? Oh, the financial transactions tax. There's always the question about retirement accounts. Won't this kill the retirement accounts? Um, as I said, really, really good analyses show um, that, that that's not really true, that um, they'll be fine. The people who will basically eat the cost of that tax are the ones who, who are the traders and the firms that make all their money off of, uh, you know, whatever, trading the, the investment portfolios. So th they would make less money. Um, but the, the cost to uh, retirees would be really quite minimal. Um, I think those are the main counter arguments that are raised. Nobody's brought this up, but if you were like a real policy person, um, you would bring up something similar to what Jeremy said and say, well, why are you trying to make all these changes at the state level? Um, th these should be made at the federal level. Otherwise, it'll create big discrepancies between different state tax regimes. And um, as, as I said, one, I think they're tolerable discrepancies. And two, um, it's really about the sort of politics of being able to make New York relate to, to, to national economic issues. 
Um, I think those are the big ones. Okay, and Doug? Hi, I, uh, if no one else uh, who hasn't spoken is interested, I'll, I'll have another issue. This is more of a large philosophical question um, and probably more applicable at the federal level in the state, but what do you, how do you view taxes on the rich? Is it a way to eliminate them as a class or do you view them as a kind of inexhaustible ATM for public purpose? Well, here functionally, um, much more the latter, um, just because of our, our spending priorities and our, our revenue needs. Um, I mean, I think that's, I like that question a lot. Something that I always sort of say, but we've not discussed a lot is, um, you know, what would it mean to use, uh, you know, taxes significantly as part of a sort of transitional strategy to socialism? I think that's possible. Um, but certainly the kind of immediate vision here um, is, I'd say, primarily to raise a lot of revenue. And then you might say as a second step to the degree that it really does bring about a higher degree of um, economic equality. Um, it's, it's still not eliminating the richest class, but it's making them less rich. And so maybe in the long term or medium term, you have sort of declining revenues but increasing economic inequality, and maybe we like that outcome. Um, but that's probably as much as I can say about it right now. Okay, um, does anyone else have any questions or comments that they wanna jump on staff to contribute? Oh, we're down to like... Uh... Yeah, we've got like 20 minutes left. Um, but I mean, we can we can always end early if we don't have any more questions. Um, okay, well, I think, okay. Well, no one has any, no one wants to hop on stack. Um, Jeremy, do you wanna make any like final announcements or like begin to close sure. this out? Okay. Thanks, Ashley. Um, so thanks so much to Nathan and Jenny, I think, um, and to everybody here. I think uh, this stuff is not always intuitive and that's why we have things like night school and that's why we have uh, such excellent people working on our campaigns. So thanks to everybody again. Um, and I wanted just to make a few announcements, but I'll first give it to Jenny to make announcements about the Tax the Rich campaign. Jenny, are you there? I think Jenny was like off and then just entered the room again. You may have to say it again. Uh, oh no. Okay. <laughs> sorry, I'm struggling today, clearly. Um, but am I plugging the actions? Yeah. Yes, okay. So there is a lot, lot, lot going on. We have two months left to try to pass as many of these bills as we can. Um, everything is in process. We are collecting co-sponsors, lead sponsors are getting their bills introduced. Um, but we know that in the New York State Senate and the assembly, legislators need pressure in order to do anything like this. Um, and even a little bit of pressure sometimes can move people. Um, so we have a pretty big organizing effort planned. I think it was in the beginning of December, we did something like 70,000 door hangers, 100,000 calls to constituents in the, who live in the district of target legislators that we want to move um, around to these bills. So we're going to be doing another big burst of actions. Um, to sign up, I'm going to send this link here. Um, we have a website and we have this catch-all volunteer page where you can type in your uh, zip code or if you're not about doing things on the ground like phone banking, um, you can sign up to phone bank. Um, and what we do is we essentially alert constituents that there is a package of bills, it's being debated in the legislature, um, and they need to contact their legislators to get them to sign on. And we've seen this work with two legislators already in Brooklyn who weren't, you know, didn't know about the package, weren't, we assumed weren't for the package, and then post actions actually committed publicly to being in support um, of our taxation us. So it is effective, it's gonna be needed, um, definitely encourage everyone to check out this link to see where they can plug in. 
And I don't know, Jeremy, do you have the link on hand for the campaign update on the first? I do, I'll drop it in the chat. Awesome, so we're also going to have, in, in, in the lead up to all of these things, um, we're gonna have a campaign update next Monday where Jabari and Marcella are going to be giving an update from inside the Senate and inside the assembly um, as to what's been going on with these bills and this campaign. Um, and you'll be able to find out a lot more about the campaign there as well. One, one last thing, thank you, Jenny. One last thing I'll also say about the phone banks, which are very cool, is that a lot of them are being co-hosted with other chapters in New York State. Um, the Tax the Rich campaign, I think, is really building like a statewide DSA political infrastructure for like the first time. I actually just did an interview for like an Ithaca radio station to talk to like the, them and whatever. So it's great. And it's a cool way to meet other um, DSA members from New York State. Uh, so yeah, uh, high, high praise for the phone banks. Um, uh, and then just last announcement. Um, I mean, obviously, if you're not a DSA member yet, you should be. Um, and, uh, and local dues, please pay local dues to New York City so we can continue to build capacity. Those local dues, many of them are going right into this campaign. So we can uh, be as ambitious and wide and spread the message as wide as we can. So uh, please do sign up for local dues. And uh, finally, next week we have, or not next week, two weeks from now, we have our next night school session, um, which is on Medicare for All with um, uh, Dr. Abdul El Saeed, uh, people might know um, from the Bernie campaign and an excellent speaker and proponent of Medicare for All, ran for governor in Michigan. Um, very cool. Uh, and he'll be joining us to talk about his new book on Medicare for All, which is dropping like next week. So um, please come and join us in two weeks. And uh, the only other thing, we're thinking about having a movie night. Um, we, sorry to bother you is something that we've talked about as maybe movie night idea. If people have other ideas for movies they wanna see, uh, feel free to write in the chat or to send us an email. Um, we'll drop our Polyette email in the chat. Um, I think that's about it, yeah? Um, thanks again so much for joining us and uh, solidarity. Thank you.